When disaster strikes, an earthquake, a tsunami, a fire, war, genocide, or some other natural or human-made disaster, you probably stopped and wondered, how can you get involved to help the people who are in need? Welcome to Diverse Voices, a series of episodes in the Psych Everywhere podcast. Hi, this is Bradley Cannon again from the Psych High Central office. In this episode, I will be speaking with Dr. Ani Kalajan about participating in humanitarian missions. Dr. Kalajan is the founder for the International Association for Trauma Outreach and Prevention, Meaningful World, a not-for-profit charitable organization affiliated with the United Nations. I was really, really excited to see that Ani was attending the Society for Cross-Cultural Research Convention because it meant that I get a chance to speak with her in person for the podcast. Ani travels to a lot of places following natural and man-made disasters in order to support people and to help them heal. She has so many stories to tell. So first things first, I wanted to welcome her to the podcast and see what places she's been to recently. Yes, yes, thank you so much, Bradley, for this mm-hmm. wonderful opportunity. So uh, I know it's been a few years, so uh, what we have done at Meaningful World is outreach, extended our outreach and expanded it. Mm-hmm. So we have uh, added uh, Puerto Rico and uh, we have uh, continued Haiti and Armenia and Middle East and Africa, but uh, the, in a new way, these countries have embraced and wanted to start their own Meaningful World. Mm-hmm which is what we were seeking, sustainability, because we're not going to continue for 100 years going there every year. It's not cost-effective, although it's a great experience for new interns and new psychologists to have their hands-on experience in another country rather than reading an article about Mm -hmm. other people, really experiencing and merging themselves into the new country. So we expanded to uh, many countries, and this year specifically, we're expanding to Niger Delta. We tried to do that five years ago, but there was bloody protests and revolution going on. They weren't able to give us visas because it was unsafe. So now um, we have two wonderful collaborators, one from Niger Delta, and he's one of the kings there and one from uh, Lagos, University of Lagos, Mm -hmm. who uh, will be providing the university connection. So we're working on that very, very tightly um, the last two weeks now. So it's been uh, great to experience that uh, people have been empowered over the years. Now it's been 30 years since uh, I founded the organization, Mm -hmm. so it's uh, uh, it has taken its own uh, journey, and now the countries realize we need meaningful world in our country. Actually, Haiti is the one who um, initiated uh, because um, their voodoo priest um, got together in a meeting, mm-hmm. and they got a training from us in the seven-step integrated healing model, and they said that wow. Okay, medical doctors address the biology and physical problems. Psychologists address the mind. Religious people address the spiritual. And the voodoo doctors, they really work with nature. But meaningful world in the seven steps addresses all. It has the psychological, Mm -hmm. the social, the uh, lessons learned, the empowerment, education, energy, Mother Earth, because we do peace building uh, uh, gardens. We um, help people initiate uh, projects for planting trees, for example. You know how many trees were destroyed after the Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico? Thousands. That Mm -hmm. luscious, beautiful island that all the trees were black and gray and burnt. It felt like it was burned. So we initiated and started with 12 Mm -hmm. trees, palm trees, and we encouraged through our social media 
donate fifty dollars and we'll plant a tree with your name on it. So that became a, a sustainable, wonderful uh, uh, activity. So uh, this uh, uh, priest said, "Meaningful work is the cure for Haiti." That's how they started their own branch there. So I'm happy to report about all these new developments. So I, I imagine that there are a lot of people who have been interested in jumping into humanitarian projects, but they weren't really sure how to get started or they were a little insecure. What do you say to people like that who are kind of on the fence or thinking about it? Oh, um, they have to do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. It has to be mindful and sound project. We have a book. Um, my first book is called uh, Disaster and Mass Trauma. And it has step-by-step step how to go to foreign country, how to reach the community leaders, ministers uh, of education, mm -hmm. health, and etc., cetera, uh, church leaders on each level. Because when you just go and help the church, that's a very limited uh, mm -hmm. number of people. When you just go and help the government, you're working just with the minister of health, it's not going out to the village. Mm -hmm. So in order for it to be sustainable, you have to reach all levels of the community. And we help people. If uh, anyone is interested, they can join one of our missions and see how it's done. Because we start at the minimum six months before the mission. For example, Niger Delta in like Nigeria, Cuba. which will be in July, God willing. And uh, we started already in October mm -hmm. planning it. So we need almost like a year, minimum six mm -hmm. months to a year to plan because a lot of these countries that are in need don't have the ease of emails. We have to call them on the phone. We have to exchange uh, uh, maybe WhatsApp text messages and uh, papers and letters and documents are most challenging for them. So uh, it takes uh, months, not like uh, uh, collaborating with a university within the United States. That would maybe, I mean, even within the United States, we have red tapes and, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, institutional uh, procedures that would take time. Like uh, setting up a conference, how you start a year in mm -hmm. advance. Missions are like that, minimum a year in advance. And you have to be mindful of four things. Researching about who are the people you are serving, their religion, their culture, their past history of trauma, how they resolved it. Are they still suffering from that? Mm -hmm. And what are their strengths and what are their challenges? Then about the socio-political climate, you have to study what's going on. If you don't know, you could be right in the middle of a fire, actually, a, a, a bomb. We were in Lebanon, although we have had a year of research before going to Lebanon, but it was the time where Hezbollah and the um, Israeli military were at conflict, and next to our building, military, Israeli military blew up the building and it felt like a 8.0 earthquake kind of shook our building and we were there in, in you know, uh, uh, we couldn't leave for uh, uh, a whole 24 hours, we had to stay indoors so there, it's not uh, glamorous uh, work, it's, it's really heart based work, you have mm -hmm. to really care about other people in other countries. Now I have other uh, friends, they like, you're crazy from New York, why are you going to Africa? You leave your comfort, you're going there, you gotta get inoculations and then you're gonna go with no water, dust, heat, no AC, mm -hmm. you know, just send them money. You're spending 4000 just to go to Africa because we don't have funding. We try to mm -hmm. pay our own way. So people who want to help can also send us tax deductible donations and we would be their agents mm -hmm. by, you know, helping them. Not everybody is uh, 
uh, really able to go. And not everybody physically can withstand it. We've had people who stayed in a wheelchair because they wanted to go, but then their body gave out with the heat and the dust and the um, polluted air. So those who want to start and they're serious, they have an organization to back them, like Meaningful World, mm -hmm. we would be happy to mentor them and liaison with them. They can, uh, we invite them to come and join one of our missions. We have uh, Haiti in June and Nigeria in July and Armenia in October for this year. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, and this we do without the uh, major external donation, and that's an area that we need to work because we can do much better outreach if we had funding and we don't need to stay in tents and compromised mm -hmm. places where our health is compromised. So that's our challenge and we're looking into different ways that we can uh, apply for funding or small grants and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I've, I have noticed though that you're very good at spreading the word about your trips in order to attract international attention and sponsors and collaborators. I wondered if you had any tips um, for people seeking to attract others to join their cause. Oh yes, well firstly you have to be passionate about the work and uh, I basically um, live for the cause. Now for example the first two weeks of January I take time for my own self-care. I go to, you know, away for a retreat, I do yoga every morning because I'm a yoga teacher. So I do yoga on the beach, but guess what? Even on my vacation, I collect like 15 people will gather <laughs> and do yoga with me. And I tell them, you know, if you like what you are uh, experiencing, please donate to MeaningfulWorld.com. And, and we had people that donated 250, <laughs> 500. Um, but they came every morning at 7.30. I mean, it's not easy on a vacation mm -hmm. to have that kind of discipline, but they have always said they're from Seattle, San Francisco, L.A., San Diego, Ohio, all different states of America. Um, they say, we have taken yoga at home, but nobody teaches the way you do. Because our, we don't call it yoga, we call it soul surfing. Mm -hmm. The reason we chose this is because we did a focus group and we found out that the men are not joining when you say yoga class. So we started trying different names. I said, mm -hmm. what about soul surfing? And the men lit up. They are like, oh, I'll join that. You know, I'll take that class. So we call it soul surfing because it's not just yoga movement it, and the breath. We use affirmations for each, for example, the heart, right? Mm -hmm. We first start, the first side is giving love to ourselves. I love, respect, and accept myself fully and unconditionally. And we repeat this. And then the other side, we say, I love, respect, and accept my family my friends, my community, my country, humanity, and all living things, fully mm -hmm. and unconditionally. So I have specific affirmations for each energy center. And with color, like ooh, the heart color, I know it's Valentine's Day today, and everywhere it's red, but the heart is green. Mm -hmm. Green is also for growth and healing and the throat is turquoise color. So each one, it's like a rainbow. Starts with red, first energy center, then orange, yellow, green, turquoise, blue, and purple. It has the same rainbow colors. Uh, our energy center is very much like the rainbow. So we have the affirmations, the color consciousness, and the mindfulness of the organs around it. So 
So when we, I'm talking about the heart, uh, I, I also mention be mindful that's where your heart organ is, your lungs, bronchioles, mm-hmm. your rib cage. So when you're working on your heart, you're strengthening all those organs, the throat, the thyroid, for example. So all this, it's a six thing intertwined in it. And it's so empowering, everyone. I teach seniors, I teach children. They all like think it's a wonderful game and they're like, wow, I came with a, a shoulder ache and neck ache. I was almost gonna cancel the workshop. I wasn't gonna come. Thank God I came. I feel so much relief. It's another person with the back problem, now it's gone. Another person with knee problem, has disappeared. One gentleman in Haiti, he said, I'm sorry, I can't take the workshop, I have to leave because my pressure, I just took my pressure, is 190 over 120. Oh my God, we hospitalize people with that. So, and we were so far away from a hospital, so he wasn't gonna make it right away. We gave the remedies, I don't know if you were at the workshop, I gave, I showed the natural remedies. Uh, natural remedies which are flower based uh, remedies from the earth mother earth specially put together for each vibrational emotional issue this is uh, about fear it helps you with composure containment when challenged by um, fear anxiety or panic Mm -hmm. and this is post-trauma stabilizer to help you recover and rebuild from shock and trauma Mm -hmm. so these are and there is one for each emotional issue and then we also use a a natural oil such as lavender and rosemary for different uh, uh, issues that you have and I'm gonna give you uh, one of the oils I have here and uh, <clears throat> this one, let's see what it is. This one is for um, rosemary. Rosemary is good for um, to improve your mood, to reduce mm-hmm. inflammation. It's big about relieving pain and inflammation. Mm-hmm. So if you have inflammation like bronchial, you're coughing, put mm-hmm. a lot of rosemary in your chest. If you have sinus infection, you put it right here in the sinuses, Mm -hmm. it drains it right away. I have it at my bedside. And it's very good for circulation and detoxing your body and protecting you from environmental germs, like other people's germs. So if Mm -hmm. you're going to uh, uh, go in a bus or a train, Mm -hmm. I would put that, uh, I always have it with me. Mm -hmm. And you can mix it with, that's 100% oil, essential oil. So mix it with a little bit of, I don't know, coconut oil or Nivea, whatever you like, uh, uh, any kind of lotion like that. So we... uh, (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So uh, we integrate all this and we make the workshop and the learning very hands-on. And we also, in the Peace and Forgiveness Gardens, we help them to give them seeds so they can plant the rosemary. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to bring the oil all the time. They can have the sage for purification, rosemary, lavender, because they're hardy plants and it grows almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these parts of uh, the ways that we help people to overcome their uh, uh, physical uh, impact of the trauma. The trauma gets stuck in the cell Mm -hmm. because we experience it physically as well, not just emotionally. Especially when you're a child and you don't have a language to say, I'm afraid or I am distressed or I am frustrated or disappointed. You don't, you just hold it in somewhere and then you don't realize you're getting the ulcer. You know how many young kids I have in my practice, at least three 17-year-olds with GI ulcers and bleeding or irritable bowel uh, IBS and all this. All stress-based, trauma-based that could be prevented. 
if people know how to do things without really waiting for it to be complicated and then you have to be hospitalized. Mm -hmm. Prevention is the best cure. That's what we work on. You're listening to Diverse Voices, a series of episodes in the Psych Everywhere podcast. Next up, Ani is going to give you some pointers about how you yourself can become involved in helping others who are in need. But first, for a moment, I wanted to jump in and tell you a little more about Ani. Dr. Kalajan was awarded an honorary Doctor of Science degree from Long Island University, recognizing 20 years as a pioneering clinical researcher, professor, humanitarian outreach administrator, community organizer, and psychospiritual facilitator around the globe and at the United Nations. She is the recipient of the 2010 Human Rights Award from the American Nurses Association, the Mentoring Award from APA's International Division, and the Humanitarian Award from University of Missouri, as well as 2016 Medal of Distinguished Lecturer from Fordham University. She is the author of Disaster and Mass Trauma, 1995, Chief Editor of the International Book Forgiveness and Reconciliation, that's 2010. Chief Editor of two volumes on mass trauma and emotional healing around the world, Rituals and Practices for Healing, Meaning Making. A guided meditation CD called From War to Peace, Transforming Generational Trauma into Meaning Making. And, as if that isn't enough, nine films on humanitarian missions from around the globe. As the SCCR convention programming continues on in multiple rooms nearby, Ani and I are seated just as far away as we can get from all the noise with our recording equipment. But for now, on with the interview. Um, so, safety first, um, what strategies should humanitarian missions sort of have in place? I know you want to protect the volunteers when you're there. Yes, I did mention about the building blowing up in Lebanon next to us. And uh, when we were in Palestine working in Farah camp, um, one o'clock in the morning, in the middle of our sleep, we were woken with this bomb. um, And the the door of the camp was blown Mm -hmm. by the... um, 25 Israeli military barged in, and this is, I know, because the camp director let us watch the um, camera, you know, their Mm -hmm. surveillance camera at the entrance of the camp. We were hiding under the bed for six hours with our interns and volunteers with extreme fear. I was just keeping on massaging them with the oils, and we were, you know, doing meditation and chanting and praying Mm -hmm. and heart-to-heart circle together, holding hands, and we were praying for the camp people because they weren't attacking us. Mm -hmm. They didn't know. I don't know. I'm sure they knew we were there, but the we found out in the morning this 19-year-old boy apparently. but they said burn the tire, you know, car tire, by the wall, and that was a crime, and why didn't they get him during the day? And they had to terrorize the entire camp, mm-hmm. uh, like uh, uh, over 800 uh, uh, or 1,200 people. So, um, and uh, for example, there would be also other things like illnesses. We were in Sri Lanka, one of our volunteers, got um, some kind of a skin rash from uh, there. So you have to be very healthy, that's one. And you have to know what your uh, points of weaknesses are in terms of like when you are overwhelmed, let's say, you didn't sleep well, you didn't go and see your uh, baby and your wife, you were deprived, you were working 20 hours and you didn't eat right, what system in your body gives out first? Mm-hmm. Is it cold? Do you get a cold? Do, do you get GI stuff? Do you, you get throat problems? Everybody has something, mm-hmm. you know, an area that is more vulnerable. Mm-hmm. So we ask volunteers in that application, what is your vulnerable area? 
do you take medications on a regular basis? We need to know. And uh, um, we need to know their habits, how to feel better, if they're distressed, what do they do. So we do a lot of questioning beforehand mm -hmm. to be able to select. And we ask the volunteers to take our trainings. So they learn the seven steps. Mm -hmm. So not only to help us in teaching, so that they can start six months before the mission, start working on their health, on their mindset, keeping positivity, doing the practices on meditation. I mean, you can't, in the middle of crisis, start learning to meditate when you haven't done it before, and the bombs are going all around you. There's no way you can do that. So, um, in, uh, uh, for example, in Kenya, we had a very uh, challenging situation. They were not our team volunteers, but we were working next to each other. That, uh, one another, other volunteers got kidnapped by mm -hmm. the uh, extremists. So, uh, uh, from the neighboring country of Somalia, and that was very frightening to our volunteers. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were. We, it was a happy ending. The Kenyan government just that the helicopter went and you know really mm -hmm. save them. So uh, there has to be many levels. First is they have to take our trainings so that they their mindset. It's not just idealistic, oh, I'm going to go on vacation, oh, yeah, maybe help some people. No, it's not like that. It's a rigorous work. We wake up at 6 and we do our own soul surfing. We walk the walk. We don't just preach that you need to do self-care. We do it as a team, and then we set goals, smart goals, and then we have breakfast, and then we take supplements. If people don't have, let's say, B12 or something, they feel low energy, we share the vitamins, and then we look at what, are, what is the schedule for the day. And then we work all day in dire situations, some dangerous, some hot with no AC, which was very challenging for me. It's still very challenging for me. That's one thing I really don't, my body don't like it. But I try to do things. I have a thermos, so I keep cold water. As long as I have cold water, I kind of manage it, put it here in the forehead, and you stimulate your vagus nerve. I didn't know why my grandma used to say that long ago. I guess they knew something. Now the science is, is, you know, scientifically proving that it's stimulating the vagus nerve and balancing our uh, energy. So uh, uh, training is important, preparation, and realistic mindset. It's not uh, we work at least 12 hours. We start at 6 waking up. Um, and we go to the field at 8, we return at 6. Mm -hmm. In the best case scenario, we try to finish at 6, but sometimes it takes two hours to get back where we live because of traffic, uh, bad roads, and really dysfunctional system, traffic system. And then we have to process mm -hmm. and have dinner, process, write notes, upload photos, write press releases, social media, etc. It would be 10, 11 before we can mm -hmm. have a quiet time to do our own meditation and journaling. So having realistic expectations. We try to work six days, have one day off, and six days, and then come back. Or have two more days to do some touristic um, excursions. So it's very important to be strong and uh, well-centered in life to be able to come out of your situation and be, help people who are traumatized. So, but we have the program to do that. You know, interns or volunteers don't have to worry about it. Once they have the uh, time and, and the, you know, the mindset that they want to do this, we give them all the tools they need, they don't have to worry about. And we will protect them, nothing has happened to us. Even though the building next door collapsed, 
we have maintained very much health and well-being in 46 countries that we have served around the world. And we believe, you know, the strength comes from helping others. Our motto is, when one helps another, both become stronger. So I feel every time I go to mission, I am more stronger. So this morning I texted Ani and I, I was just checking in to make sure we were ready for the interview. And she responded, um, she said, Good morning, Bradley. Happy Valentine's Day. Let love transform you. Let the flames of love transform your pain into purpose. Let love shower you with affection, embracing you with unconditional kindness. Let love heal and transform your wounds into wisdom. And there's actually more than that. It's even longer than that. That's one of the reasons that I was so excited when I saw she would be um, at the convention that I'm attending, SCCR. I was so excited to reach out to her because she always surprises me with her amazing optimism, and I, I was so thrilled. And so, but I know also you see a lot of people having a lot of very challenging situations. So I wanted to ask you, how do you how do you stay so positive and uplifting? One of the core um, uh, practices is uh, really walking the walk mm -hmm. myself. So it's not like I yeah. Uh, uh, or our organization promotes the importance of energy, movement, physical movement. It could be through dance, stretching, yoga, you can name it. Some people get like offended because they don't know about yoga and they think we're trying to convert them to Buddhism. Mm -hmm. and they have these false connections or false belief systems. So we tr try. I try to always move my body, have time to meditate in the morning, uh, turn off all digital by 8 o'clock at night so that uh, I can have time to meditate, be my fam with my family, watch a funny comedy, and sleep in a positive mood. Because what happens is that I found that positivity attracts more positivity. So I put extra effort in my own way of living so that I can transform all the pain and all, or else I will have secondary trauma if I don't do that. It's very important. Right. Um, so regarding man-made disasters in particular, um, I know you're there in a lot of ways to help people to forgive and heal. And why is it so difficult to forgive? Oh, yes, that's a, such a wonderful question. Uh, first, let me try to mm -hmm. edit you. Uh, the men protested. They said they didn't like man-made. Why is it man-made? <laughs> uh, so, so they protested to the UN. This was years ago. So uh, about 10 years ago, the UN changed it to human-made disasters, okay. human -made not man-made. <laughs> so it's not man-made any longer, which is a little oxymoron. How can it be human-made if you're human? you try to avoid giving pain, causing pain and trauma to others, right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, we have to live with that. Um, with human-made traumas, um, more specifically, the question is how to help them forgive and what is about forgiveness that is so challenging and difficult for them. I think the first knee-jerk reaction for people, even in my private practice, I don't mean just in other countries, I mean right in America, right in New York, New Jersey, wherever I have practiced, people have this uh, assumption that forgiveness is giving a gift to someone else. But it's not at all. Mm -hmm. The gift you're giving to yourself, and that gift is sanity, <laughs> uh, coming from your um, total uh, being free of the chains of anger and the resentment and giving back the pain that they caused you. You know how much energy people spend mm -hmm. thinking about how I'm going to get back at this person? And even I was shocked. One day, a client told me that there was a show, revenge. Sweet revenge, mind mm -hmm. you. Now, there's nothing sweet about revenge. It's all toxic. Because, as Martin Luther King says, an eye for an eye makes us all blind. So, your eye, something happened to it, 
then you take somebody else's eye. How is that helping your eye? It's not. It's just adding another person suffering who, in fact, is going to retaliate, just like you did. And the cycle will continue going down the spiral to really the dark vacuum that people can't get out and they feel more angry, more frustrated, and they start lashing out at people. So the first thing we do is being mindful, helping the person know that it's a gift for yourself. You're going to sleep better, you're going, your digestive system is going to digest and assimilate the food better, you're going to have a peace of mind, and you're going to transmit and pass on to your children these kinds of wonderful values of peaceful values of forgiving because we are humans and we all make mistakes. None of us have, uh, um, you know, can say that we have never made any mistakes. It's, it's a human thing. As they say, um, to err is human, but to forgive is divine. Now that isn't the other part. Forgiveness was closely attached to religions for a long time. And religion kind of summons you to forgive or else you're going to be punished. It gives that guilt that as if you have to. It's not like that. The psychological forgiveness that we teach would be first healing yourself. You cannot forgive if you're still in pain. The pain is going to make you reject all the good things because the pain is so addictive and the anger, you want to continue doing that. You think you're doing something good. You, you think you're energized with the anger. I've had mothers come to me after my forgiveness lectures and say, I need the anger. What right do you have to take away what's keeping me alive? And I would really simply say, there is another way to be alive without poisoning yourself. Because the anger is first and foremost, is angering me, uh, hurting me, poisoning me, and I'm expecting somebody else to be impacted by it. They're oblivious, they're going on in their merry ways. Whoever hypothetically have caused the problem to me. So we have to be mindful that we are taking care of ourselves, first by healing our trauma, then forgiving the other because that person too is a human being and people shift. They don't get stuck. I mean, some people do get stuck if uh, you are not mindful. You can get stuck in your habits and mm -hmm. generate negative cycles. And that's what we do. We help people realize, did you notice that you have been doing this for five years? And then they would be, oh my God, I even forget, forgot that. How do you remember it? And how, now I realize what you're talking about. You know, so they have the aha moment. And after that, it's much easier because the walls are down. Because when we're angry, we have walls, invisible walls all around us. We're keeping the armor all around us because we feel so hurt. Our heart is so much in pain. We need to put walls around us. But when you heal the trauma, you no longer need the walls. And you find that that energy you're spending to put these artificial walls, you don't need them anymore. Walls are just obstacles. You need to let go and let be free, yourself and others. I mean, it's symbolic, right? We're mm -hmm. talking about walls and our president talks about walls. Mm -hmm. um, that's very symbolic of how people think. They think walls are protective, but they're not. They're artificial. Mm -hmm. And those um, artificial walls or different obstacles we've set in our way, it becomes our worst enemy. And then we turn around and we say, look, what happened? I'm a victim, which is very addictive. So we try to 
uh, make people and communities realize, like Haiti, for example, suffers from that collective victimhood. Palestine, Armenia, they suffer from that collective victimhood because they've had generational trauma, then they had situational trauma, then they had the natural disaster on top of that, then they had the Soviet, in case of the Armenia, the Soviet regime, 75 years. In case of Haiti, the, the corrupt political government for centuries. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, it has this, and they never had a chance to heal. So they have this poor me mentality. And the more they s become and experience the victimhood psyche, the more they're attracting more traumas into them. And for them, the F word of forgiveness is the most difficult. In our research of 15 countries, including Africa, Burundi, Rwanda, Kenya, Congo, Sierra Leone, Middle East, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, and in Haiti, Dominican Republic, Armenia, Romania, about 15 countries, and we found that Middle East and Armenia are having the worst problem in forgiving. Mm. Is the other reason is because the conflict is ongoing. There is no post mm. to reflect when you're constantly re-traumatized, you don't have that time and energy to heal the wounds and then to learn a lesson and then to shift the pattern. So we're hoping that through social justice and through getting involved in the political leadership, because uh, we, Meaningful World, whenever we go to countries to uh, serve them, to help them in their humanitarian relief work. We always try to also connect with ministers of health, education, social welfare, mm -hmm. so that their social workers, psychologists, if they have nurses, are trained in our holistic mm -hmm. seven-step integrative model so that when they are faced with um, different atrocities or traumas, they can help their um, populations. Teachers, for example, is a large number of people that we train so that they and most of the teachers are have secondary trauma, most of them, mm -hmm. both in Haiti and now even the Secretary General at the United Nations, he did a survey United Nations all around the world, and he found out high anxiety, high uh, violence in the workplace, mm -hmm. high trauma, high secondary trauma, and now they have embraced this mental health initiatives. Can you believe? For 30 years I've been trying to <laughs> tell them and they wouldn't. You know, when we push them, starting with Butros Butros Gali in 88, and they were looking at us and said, oh, we don't need it. We have a social worker. She works half time. If they have a problem, they go and see her. That was the mindset. But now the Secretary General is initiating a survey and realizing the mental health needs of the UN population, especially the peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you read how peacekeepers are going, traumatizing the people, the very people they're supposed to protect. Mm -hmm. Not because they're evil, they're traumatized. They see so much, they witness so much suffering, pain, and torture, they become desensitized. Well, I think that's all the questions that I had. Was there anything that you wanted to add? I am not uh, really. I think you were so great and comprehensive in your questions. I would just wanted to uh, plug in the Forget Me Not book uh, okay. as uh, integrates a seven step for healing our body, mind, spirit, and Mother Earth. And it's very small. I didn't really 
you know, I focused only on the seventh step, although in the beginning there's a short area about my journey, what made me choose to work with humanitarian relief work. And it, the, the other important thing is that each chapter has a list of questions. It's called self-reflection. Mm -hmm. So how does what you read applies to you? So it asks specifically, identify your support system. Write about who they are, how they are supportive to you. Uh, have you found yourself losing control of your emotions and blowing up or having an anger outburst? Identify three feelings that you felt from the anger wheel. Reflect on the negative consequences you had to endure due to this outburst. I'm going to give you this as a gift. Oh, thank you. And you can share it okay. when you read. I won't put your name so that uh, when okay. you read, you can feel free. I understand that. I think uh, books are important to travel. <laughs> Ani, I know our listeners really appreciate hearing from you and getting to learn a little about your work. I know I do too. Thank you so much for speaking with us and inspiring us today. Listeners, would you like to learn more about Meaningful World and Dr. Kalajan's advice for humanitarian missions? As it so happens, I also conducted a magazine interview with Ani a couple years ago. You should definitely check it out. To read it, visit the Psychi website, that's P-S-I-C-H-I dot O-R-G, and search for Humanitarian Work, Experiences and Advice with Ani Kalajan in the search bar. I can't think of a better way to end a very special interview with Ani than for her to read us a poem. So with that being said, I'm going to let her take it from here. a Syrian refugee. I'm an Armenian Syrian immigrant, immigrated in mid-70s. My first week in American high school, I was called a dirty immigrant. When asked what I was, I responded Armenian. They asked in a demeaning way, what's that? I said Armenia was partially a republic in Soviet Union at the time, uh, independent since 92. The other larger part is occupied by Turkey. They pushed me away claiming I was a communist, like it was a disease. But I told them I was not even born in Armenia. <laughs> I was born in Syria, as my father and his family were forced out of their home in Anatolia after killing a million and a half and forcing them out of their own homes. I am a Syrian refugee. Where is Syria? You must be a terrorist, they added. Do you have refrigerators? How about TV? Do you ride camels and donkeys? And continued with their sly remarks, putting down who I was and where I was from. It has been eight years to the war in Syria, and it is not only due to a dictator president, it's because larger countries have made Syria a battleground to sell their arms and ammunitions, weaken Syria, which was the only strong Arab country in the Middle East. In 2016, I heard our congressman advising to only allow Christian and not Syrians to America. I'm shocked in dismay, wondering, don't you know that Syrians could be all religions? And what does religion got to do with the terrorism? Why is that I don't feel lucky and happy about being Christian? Perhaps because it was a century ago Armenians were beheaded by Ottoman Turks if they did not convert from Christianity to Islam. Over three million Armenians were subjected into a forced march to their death in Arabian deserts. So shall we exclude all Christians as terrorists in Columbus were Christians? Shall we exclude all Jews as those oppressing Palestinians in Israel are, are all Jewish? Shall we exclude all Buddhists as the terrorists in Myanmar are Buddhist? And where do we draw the line of sanity and stop? I'm a Syrian refugee and I'm grateful for the human rights that we enjoy here in the USA. 
I was tired of being squeezed between two brothers, stripped of all my human rights as a girl first and then as a woman, subjected to gender stereotyping and discrimination. I'm grateful of all the opportunities I enjoy here in USA. My parents prohibited me from riding a bicycle in Syria. Here in USA, I learned to ride a motorcycle. <laughs> we were traumatized of wars all around us in the Middle East. Here we are in a bubble. We contribute to conflicts all around us, but then attempt to sit pretty, mighty, pseudo-safe, and big while wondering why are certain people targeting us? I'm grateful of all the opportunities I enjoy here in USA. While it should be practiced around the world, everywhere, as the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, gender, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. I am an Armenian Syrian refugee, now an American citizen. I am filled with sadness and disappointment as we are subjecting thousands of humans to unnecessary trauma. Instead of embracing Syrians with empathy and compassion, we are becoming border judges examining their faith. Yet no one is asking what has happened to our faith. And how about the golden rule? Do unto others what you wish to be done to you. I also have much hope and empathy, of course, as I meet strangers who express words of empathy to me as they send their compassion and condolences for my fallen relatives in Syria, which filled my heart with peace, instilling a deep sense of hope and ever-present compassion, the courage to endure, the passion to take one day at a time, and the wisdom to be truly mindful and present. Okay, everyone, that's all for now. Talk to you again soon. Copyright 2019, Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. All rights reserved.